already dropping stuff. <laughs> well, happy Sabbath to you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to start with a joke, but that kind of went along with exactly where I was going with the message, and then I feel like now the joke would mess it up. But <laughs> if I go off script, then this will turn into just me jibber-jabbering about stuff. So might as well tell the joke. <laughs> <laughs> so Jewish man comes home, and his son comes to him, and he says, Hey, I found Jesus. I'm a Christian now. Jewish man was taken back. So he went to his rabbi. His rabbi goes, hang on, before you say anything, I just want you to know, my son just came home. He said he found Jesus. Well, they were both kind of perplexed. They didn't know what to do, so they were like, we need to pray. So they went to pray to God. And all of a sudden, they heard a thundering voice that said, before you start, guess what my son did? <laughs> and if you're not tracking on that one, Jesus, Jew, and then Christian, right? See? <laughs> I tried. I, I was... So, the title of what I'm going to get into is uh, Who He Chooses. But before I go there, I've been here for, physically here for over a year. And I've been coming in here for a little more than that when I'd fly over from Alabama. So I figured I will start today with telling you who I am, where I came from. Essentially, this is my testimony. So I'm Corey Spann. I'm born of my parents who, were, who had me out of wedlock about nine months before they got married. Uh, and then my dad, who not having a good job at the time and both of my mom and dad living off the government, decided he was going to enlist in the Marine Corps, like his dad before him. Um, so he was in the MEPS office getting uh, his medical stuff done, getting ready to go to boot camp, and he found a pamphlet. And a pamphlet was from Worldwide. So he was reading on some things, and uh, he found himself right at the end of boot camp becoming a conscientious objector. So my father signed up, went through the toughest thing, never got to a fleet position because after boot camp he got his EGA and he uh, went to his infantry school and he refused to work on the Sabbath. Um, he told them that he needed off on the holy days, things like that. Well, they separated him other than honorable. Uh, years later he did have that change to uh, general discharge. Um, so we were in a mixture as I was growing up, a little bit of Christmas, a little bit of Halloween, a little bit of the feast. Uh, and as my dad progressed one way, my mother progressed the opposite way. So my dad started wanting more of the word. And going down that path, we, with my dad, would be a little bit more straight-edged and doing things with purpose and him reminding us as consistently as he could about why he made the choices that he made and not knowing a lot of different things behind the scenes for all these years, all these years with him and my mom and how difficult those things were when you're, I mean, th this goes to show that being unequally yoked um, without having good foundation is, it, it requires all your strength and then anything that the Lord will provide you because uh, later on we'll, we'll get to that later on uh, so I grew up in West Tennessee in a Bible Belt town and I didn't eat pork and I went to church on the Sabbath and I was Jew boy because they didn't know what else to call it uh, they, they just had no other idea, and I didn't know what to say because I was a kid, and we didn't really have a big idea of the world around us, so I was a Jew boy. Uh, <laughs> as, I, uh, as I went through those stages of being poked and prodded consistently uh, to the point where I would have literal doctrinal um, 
discussions with my math teacher, Mr. Churchwell, who was a, uh, I forget which denomination, but he was a, a Sunday keeping pastor on the weekends, and he was also a karate instructor. So I spent a lot of time with this guy. I was in his karate class, um, and there would come these times where, you know, we would be doing something about math, and it would come up, and I would defend my position, because that's where I came from. Uh, I don't just let, even as a child, I wouldn't just let uh, something pass by without saying something about it. Well, I had literally been brought to the principal's office before for telling a kid that Santa Claus wasn't real. <laughs> they called my dad, and he thought something was wrong, and then they were like, before, you know, before you get too aggravated, it's nothing you need to come down here for. And he's like, I'm about to come down there because this is ridiculous and tell you to your face, not because my son did anything wrong. Uh, what's the deal? And they're like, well, this is a predominantly uh, Christian area. So these are the beliefs we hold, and, and your son's just going around doing this. It's, it's disrespectful. So that was one of my earliest introductions to people having conflict with uh, just basic truth. Um, I struggled in school after that point. Uh, I, I was pretty much honorable. My dad had taught me to do cursive and math and stuff before I went to kindergarten. And because of where my birthday falls, I started school at uh, four years old. Um, but it was the end of four. I was turning five uh, that September. So around sixth grade or so, I started noticing girls and bored with school, and my grades literally went from straight on a roll to I was lying about homework. Uh, in fact, lying started becoming pretty normal because this whole time I was living in a house where my dad was trying to honor the word and my mom was trying to keep the world in the home at the same time. Uh, and I just, it's, it's my fault, but I developed pathological lying where it could be about anything, but if, even if it wasn't me getting in trouble, I, I'm going to lie about it. Some reason, some way, I don't know why. Well, I, I do know that a lot of my learning wasn't strictly from school. I do remember that every day uh, at the beginning of the week, my dad would have me and my little brother pick from uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. We'd pick one of the letter ranges. He would say, pick something in there, and by the end of the week, I want you know, a three to a five paragraph essay on, on this thing, and, you, and if anything's repeated verbatim, then uh, you will start over and you'll do two papers next week. So there was that sort of learning uh, where it was coupled up with by the time he started speaking in our church, he started having me uh, put together many sermons, sermonettes. I wasn't speaking to anyone, but we had to do this in the living room in front of him. So uh, he would do stuff to where like we would be really good at it to a point, and then once we got good at it, comfortable, he would start doing something like joking around while we were trying to give the presentation or whatever. And anyway, this was... Uh, it was really weird. I never wanted any friends over. In fact, the friends that I did have, they didn't want me over either because I acted the same way at school as I did at home uh, until we got into class, and then I was a different person. I would always find a way to lie again. So I put on a, a persona, and I started at school trying to fit in with the world. So at home, I was doing what my dad said. I'd go to school, try to fit in with the world. Um, I... I really, really had a profound love when I was at home for the word. And I remember one night after uh, September the 11th of 2001, uh, I was lying in my bed and I was, I was praying to God and I was saying, you know, I'm here, send me. I'll, I'll do this. Uh, I, I, was, I was so caught up in everything about that that I was also saying, uh, do unto me like you did with Elisha. Give me double the same way that Elisha asked from Elijah. 
and I, I'll go out there and I'll, I'm going to do something. And then I would go to school and I would completely forget about that, be a different man, a different kid. Well, fast forward to the end of high school and I was, I don't I think seven months from graduating. So it was pretty, pretty early on in the, the senior year and I was off with my friends pretty regularly. I was smoking pot with them pretty much as often as I could. Um, and I decided because the world was really comfortable and accepted me as the liar that I was that I moved out. So I moved out and I moved in with a, a stoner friend whose mom literally was uh, kept pot for us and said that you can do this here because better do it here than get arrested out there. So as I saw the world was more and more comfortable, but without any prompting, and without any other changes in, in my life, I remembered some pretty golden times that involved the Lord, and that was camp, um, church camp in Oklahoma, and uh, that, that was the last year I went to, and that was also the place that I met my wife. Uh, it was it was what would become very paramount to me later, but I thought of all the people there who I was letting down because essentially I was lying to them while I was there. I was making these friendships, but I was pretending that I was a part of God's church. And I was also pretending that I was part of the world. Uh, and I, at that moment, I was like, I, I've made a facade of, of my entire childhood and most of my teenage years the only way to fix this is to go into the Marine Corps. And I met my dad at a Walmart, and uh, the man's got a sense of humor, uh, no matter what's going on. So I'm following him through, and I'm, I'm explaining to him I messed up, and I, I want to fix things and stuff. And we're going to check out, uh, and he turns and he looks at me, and check out ladies right there, and he's like, hang on a second, Corey, did, did you remember your diapers? And the checkout lady looks over at me, and I'm like, oh, you still love me. You wouldn't poke at me like that if you didn't still love me. He made me understand that uh, I could move back in under the rule that I get my GED, which is the bare minimum to go in the Marine Corps, and that I would pay for my portion of the home and my groceries and everything. So obviously I wanted to make getting in the Marine Corps a very quick priority because I didn't have a job at that time. Um, I left off to boot camp in a way that was different than even my dad or his dad. We left on a bus and it was a whole bunch of people and we left from Memphis, the Meps in Memphis, and we drove all the way across Tennessee. Uh, and on that way, we dropped people off. I thought we were all going to Marine Corps boot camp, but apparently we were dropping people off at Army boot camp where the drill sergeants there were asking them kindly to grab their bags and get off the bus and, and asking their names as they were getting off. And then we went a little further and we dropped some people off at an Air Force boot camp. And uh, that was a lot nicer. And I was like, wow, I guess I didn't make such a bad decision. Uh, this should be pretty easy, right? Um, then it was just me and one other guy, one other recruit on this big old bus. And the driver had not spoken a single word the whole way. Turns out this guy was a prior service Marine and we're chit-chatting back and forth, and we're like, man, I guess this wasn't as bad as we thought. Just kind of making light of the situation. We got to, right before we got to Paris Island, the driver looked up in the mirror in a loud voice, and he said, you need to put your heads down and do not speak for the rest of this trip. And I, with the last bit of rebellion that I had, was like, why is that? And he said, so you don't know how to get off the island. So then it got serious, and I was like, oh, this is a little different. We got to the yellow footprints. Um, I stood on the very front one, and then the other guy with me stood on the one to the right. And uh, we got chewed out by three drill instructors, and they were pretty livid because they were blaming us for the bus being late. Uh, but we couldn't respond, obviously. It's Marine Corps boot camp. You're not a person. Um, we get in, we get in, we're getting processed, uh, and it's about an hour into being there and being consistently screamed at with no idea what's going on or what to do, and I'm in line, and we catch up to a group, and uh, they're doing the phone call, and we're in line with the phone call. And uh, I get to the front, 
I make the call and it rings, 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 rings. Nope, go to the back. Uh, get back to the front. There's less people now. Rings, rings, rings. No call. I get in the back of the line again. And as I'm coming up, uh, the drill instructor was like, you've been in line twice. Well, no, he didn't say that. He yelled some things that had a bunch of bleep words in it. And he was like, I guess nobody likes you, huh? Yes, you don't have any family. You know what? I'll give you some phone numbers to call. And I'm dialing. And finally, I hear my dad with a groggy voice on the other side pick up. Well, you're not allowed to say what you want to say. You can't say goodbye or help me. Um, so you read off this list here, and you insert your name, and basically you're telling them, hey, I've arrived safely aboard uh, Recruit Depot, Paris Island, South Carolina. Um, do not send any packages or any bulky mail or anything like that, and I will respond to you whenever I get a chance. Thank you and goodbye, and hang up the phone. So fast forward further, uh, I'm in the fleet. Uh, I have already gotten multiple tattoos. Um, I am getting ready to go home on leave. Uh, this is early, early, early on. And I go home, and I'm in the garage with my dad. And my dad's got a nice big stogie for me, like big old cigar, and he's got one. And, and we're sharing a beer together. And, uh, and I tell him, man, you know, I have to thank you again for everything you've done, but especially for having me stick with, with uh, church camp, even the last couple years when I didn't want to go. Because it was those, those songs, those hymns, those late nights where we were singing worship music that got me through some of the times where I wanted to break and I was done. <clears throat> and he looked at me and he said, son, that's just music. That's just your feelings of how you feel when the music is going. The only thing that got you through boot camp was you. And I was perplexed because this is my dad, the guy who guided me through everything. And, and he looked me in the eye and he goes, before you say anything else, I, I just want you to know I don't, I don't do any of that anymore. I haven't. You've been gone uh, and there's been lots of things happening. And for years, I don't know if you have noticed, but me and your mom's fighting all the time has actually been over her cheating. And this last time, it was with your uncle. And there's no way that, and this is him, there's no way that me, being a man who's given everything to my kids and everything to this church that we go to, spoke so many times on, on good things that, that this guy that's up there is even watching, even cares. So even if he is there, I, I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going, I've been eating bacon. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. Uh, there's nobody watching. And I don't, I don't remember a response because it was almost like static. My head was filled with static. My ears were filled with static. It was almost like tinnitus before I even got it. And I went back out to the fleet, and I did what he did. I did everything possible, minus two or three different things that were in opposition to God. I got deployed, went to Afghanistan, uh, and the whole time my mother was sending me mail about how horrible my dad was, but my dad stuck to trying his best, and he told me how good things were going to be and how proud he was and how... I am doing things 10 times better than he ever did. Uh, and one call that I finally got to make, we, we used to make these phone calls on satellite phones. Uh, they're called Iridium, and the phone calls are literally $450 per minute uh, at that time. So they were expensive calls on the taxpayer dollar uh, to home. and. Within the first minute of making connection on the phone with my dad, he said, uh, your mother and I got divorced and I live in Florida now. And um, I wanted to tell you, I know I don't usually tell you bad stuff, but I wanted to tell you before she told you, before you called her, uh, because um, she's going to keep your brother and sister with her. Uh, and, you know, that, that literally was like the last straw um, I did everything I did for family and for God up to that point, even if it was the facade of me or whatever it was, 
And then there was nothing left then. I had no family. Like, to me, that meant that family didn't carry the same weight as I thought it should. So I get back. Um, within a couple months, I found a motorcycle club, a uh, three-piece motorcycle club. I will not mention their name. Uh, and started rolling around with them. And I prospected for them for over a year, um, which required me to do a lot of things that I was already OK with doing. Um, I then uh, got patched in uh, in a very crazy, ceremonious way that they do. Um, and I spent five years doing even more of the opposite on purpose because I was so angry. I ended up having uh, my first child out of wedlock with my, I've, I've only been married one other time, and, uh, and I was then a practicing heathen, which was just literally trying to find ways, right? Just being as obstinate as possible. Uh, and my wife at the time, my ex-wife, she was a very, very mixed signals type Christian, like some things were okay and some things weren't. And I mean by some things, it was very questionable moral things. But I was so pressed against the Lord at the time that I, since I did know the Bible better than her, I would put her down about Christmas. I would put her down about Easter. I would, be, I, I would, I would explain to her, basically, you're worshiping the same gods I am doing all this Ishtar stuff and worshiping after the sun and all these other things. and so I, It had gotten to that last point. I became the opposite of anything good. And everything got taken away from me, slowly and incrementally. I got kicked out of that motorcycle club. I uh, separated from my wife. I, uh, I, I was homeless for a good part of a uh, year. Um, and I had gotten to the point where there was nothing left that resembled who I was ever. Um, there's not, like my, my wife Morgan, she wouldn't have been able to recognize me either. I, I didn't have any characteristics of good. I didn't, I didn't try. I, I stopped trying. I stopped trying at work. I stopped trying anywhere. It was about getting drunk, getting high, and getting any pleasure I could out of life. Um, fast forward to, I was, I was now, uh, it's about 2016-ish, I uh, was employed for a beer company and I was throwing beer at night onto pallets for about seven something an hour, uh, 14 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, or a night actually. We would load the pallets, load the pallets on the trucks, the trucks would leave, go distribute them. And I was doing this for a while, and uh, a guy came in who's a prior service Marine who retired from the Marine Corps, and he was still working. He worked for a company called uh, Carolina Handling, which is a part of the company that I work for now. Uh, he worked on the Raymond trucks, and the guy was happy. He was happy every day. It didn't matter how dirty he was or anything like that. And I started remembering my dad, because I didn't, I didn't have much contact with any of my family. And... As that relationship grew, he uh, convinced me that, you know, I had the aptitude to do better, um, so I applied for that company. Uh, once I applied for that company, there was, it was the biggest pay raise I ever got. I, I literally, it was a 10, no, 10 or $11 raise from there, uh, but they asked me to move. So I moved for, for the betterment of my son at the time, so I could have insurance for him, because I, I didn't have insurance at this company. I was barely making enough to put gas in my vehicle to go to work. So now I, I've got insurance for my son. I moved to Panama City, and here comes um, just a couple more slaps in the face. I was trying to live the way that I used to still, but have a good job and requirements in my life. And I was doing everything slowly, creeping right back into where I was at. And one night, after being drunk for three days straight, literally, um, could not keep my eyes open anymore. Uh, I fell asleep in the kitchen. I woke up, 
And I, was, I, was, I woke up crying. I woke up bawling. So there was nothing left. I didn't even get to see my son anymore. We didn't have any paperwork between my ex-wife and I, but I didn't have the money to drive from Panama City back to Pensacola to go do that. I had nothing. My dad was disappointed. Uh, and that was the last person that I wanted to disappoint, and I didn't realize that I was doing that to my son as well. And that took years to understand that, but I was crying when I woke up, and I started begging, but I didn't know who I was begging to. I was just begging. I need to get out of this. And that beg slowly turned into me asking again for the Lord to help me. And I, I, I repeated everything that I could remember about my past. I said, I remember, Lord, that I promised you that I, that I would be somebody that stood in the gap. I promised that I was going to I was going to be a man chosen and set apart that I was going to do these things and I've lost everything and it's because of that reason I wasn't going to lie to him this time and I said it's because of that reason I've lost everything that, that I'm turning to you now and, and it's not a good excuse but when we're at the bottom of our, our uh, addictions and our uh, depression and, and our self-hatred that's it's best just be honest with the Lord just being honest with him uh, and I dug through my boxes that I never opened. I found one Bible, and this is the one that was in the box. I usually have the Jerusalem Bible up here with me, but um, this was the one my, my dad gave me because uh, he said he didn't need Bibles anymore. And I was, I was reading, and I'd flip, and I was reading, and I'd flip, and I was reading. And I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't remember what I was doing. And then I, I got to Revelations. And I started reading that out loud, and I ran across the part in Revelation where it says that blessed are those who read this out loud. So I just did that for like the whole day. I, I, uh, it was either a Saturday or Sunday. But by the time my work day was rolling around, I called the man who came here and married my wife and I, uh, who baptized me later on that year. I called him and I said, I don't know what to do. The only thing I can do right now is read, and I don't know what to do. Uh, and I explained everything. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I, I need to make the change. I need, I need to be completely devoted. I need to be baptized. I need it. And he said, you can't just want to be baptized, and then that's going to fix what you do, Corey. And I said, I know, but I'm looking at this like I looked at boot camp. If I don't go and do that thing, if I don't at least try to step my foot in that door, in that direction, then I'm not going to do it. I'm not a strong man. I know I got up here and I, I, I gave a message about David and about what men should be, but that was not me ever. Well, I got baptized um, September the 23rd that year. I believe the feast started on the 24th. Uh, and the week that I got back, Hurricane Michael, the strongest hurricane to hit the Gulf Coast in years, Category 5, come through and laid waste to everything. So I lived at 1014 uh, Minnesota Avenue at the time. The reason why this is important is you can go on the NOAA website and look up Hurricane Michael damage and go to my street and see that my house did not have a single tree on its roof. Every house in the entire city of Lynn Haven, it was right north of uh, Panama City, had trees through their roofs. My roof had maintained its structural integrity and not a single tree was on it. Well, I gave that thanks to God. Uh, I started working on the people's houses around me. Uh, my company sent down my sales manager and uh, my district manager, and they brought their personal bush hog and a 10-foot pull-behind grill. And while I cut trees, they made food for the people on the street and helped move the limbs and stuff. Uh, and I was on the fourth or fifth day of working from the time the sun was up to the time the sun was down. Something that happens in hurricanes, by the way, if you don't know this, it takes away all the bugs. No bugs. There's no sound at night. 
There's not a single mosquito or anything. You can lay out under the stars. There was no power or nothing. You, in Florida, for the first time in my entire life, I saw literally everything up there. It was magnificent. And I called Danny. So I, the, the only way I could make calls was to get in my work van, plug my phone into the van, and make the call out because uh, all the cell phone towers were down. And I made a phone call to Danny, and I was like, it's the end of the day Friday, today. Sabbath is coming. I just got baptized. I don't want to do this wrong. Uh, there's still tons to do. My next door neighbor, uh, the, the tree that's in there, you can hear it creaking every day coming down further and further in this house. And he said, is there donkey in a ditch? And I said, well, there's a lot of donkeys in a lot of ditches right now. He said, well, there's your answer. You can always call me and ask, but every answer you're going to need from now on is right there, right there in that book. And you don't have any other distractions. You have work to do, and you have the word. So what should you do? And I said, I should read and work, right? And he said, yeah. Yeah, because that's what the apostles did. The apostles worked, and they talked about the word of God. That's all they, that's what they did. They moved around. They did their work. They did their labor. And he said, that's what you need to do. So from then out, I started uh, trying to find accountability more and more. Uh, I rectified as best I could with my son's mom. Um, and I went to her with a list where I wrote down every single thing that I could possibly remember that I had slided her on ever. And I... I went through and I spoke out the thing, and then I told her how I felt, which made me do those things, and they were unacceptable. I did every one of those things, and, um, you know, it, it didn't work out, um, and we separated, but that was a part of my understanding of how, how we should treat each other, and I was fresh and bright and bushy-tailed, and everything was good, and, um, and... I always, I always kept thinking, you know, the reason, why, the reason why I didn't have anything super big or divine in my life was because I wasn't called like the people that I read about. That I wasn't specifically, he didn't, he didn't pick up his phone. The Lord didn't dial me up and say, hey, Corey, I need you to go do something for me. Well, I was wrong about that. I've been wrong about that so much. Um, so, how are we doing on time? All right, so, if I could have you turn to John 1. John 1. So, I needed to figure out who I was following. So, here he is. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart, of, uh, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So at this point, we understand that he created the, where we're at, what we're doing. We understand that because he was with God. He was in the beginning, and all things came into being through him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, came, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. Those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. There's a lot of grace there. Something that I know I've, I've lacked and I, I continue to have issues understanding. But right now we're going to see about grace. In the very beginning, there was a rule. So God made Adam and Eve. He made everything. And there was a rule. Don't eat of this tree. And what did he do? Did he stand over them? He didn't stand there and watch them and just wait for them to do something wrong. Staring at like their eye. Hey, why did you squint at that lemon? Do you not like lemons? He wasn't, he wasn't overbearing. He wasn't just standing on top of them. He, he gave them grace. He gave them space to do what they please, which is even to mess up. So we'll fast forward to Noah. In Genesis 6, Noah was called by God. It was a direct calling. He was told, hey, I need you to do this thing for me because he found grace in Noah. Then we'll fast forward to Abraham. Abraham, makes, he makes a great nation out of him. He called him directly. He said, get up out of your land and go to a place. So let's turn to Genesis 12. A lot of the understanding of who exactly Yahweh is, is, is in just the beginning alone. Now, this is Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, leave your relatives, and leave your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So this sets up the the nomad nature in which many, many of the patriarchs are. Uh, and, and through this idea of moving around, we can see who our, who our, our uh, Savior is, who our, who our God is. We can see this because if we go to 1 Kings 22, over to 1 Kings 22, out of four different representations, we'll go through these real quick, of the throne. In Kings 22, 19, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and the host of heaven standing beside him in his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab to go and fall at Ramoth Gilead? So just in this quick spot there, just in seeing him on his throne, the throne, and this, this repeats in, in to the next books that I'll get into, but the, it's the throne and there's things around him. So uh, let's see, Isaiah 6. You don't, have to turn, you don't have to turn to these next three. I'll go through them real quick. Isaiah 6. The seraphim stood above him. Well, let's go back to the first one. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exhausted, exa exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, and having six wings... And with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresholds tremble. And this is important because 
wouldn't the foundations of the ground or wherever this throne was tremble as well? Uh, what we're starting to get uh, is, is a picture that um, will be more verified through uh, other prophets' visions of the throne is this throne doesn't sit in one spot. Just like the grace he gave us when we were created, he's not standing over you the whole time. He's giving you space just like, just like in, in seasons where you're doing wrong and you're not being punished. He says, it's not because I'm letting you do those things because I, I agree with them. It's because I'm giving you space to repent. Uh, like in Sodom and Gomorrah, he wasn't going to take the words of the people or even his messengers to go destroy two cities. He had to go down on his own physically to go see, to smell, to taste, to be around this corruption and to see it so he knew that he was making a good decision. So he didn't stand there and just watch Sodom and Gomorrah slowly become more and more depraved. Once it had gotten to that point, he, he came down. So what we're, what we're establishing here is that who he's choosing out of the people, who, these big, big stories that we have, these people are nomadic. They're usually moving around. They resemble him. Now, David and, of course, some other kings, they're in Jerusalem and they're not going, but there's a, there's a typology there because Jerusalem is a, a physical representation of, of the direction in which he wants us to go with, with a, a good man like David over the tribes and things like that. But overall, with Abraham being the father of all of these things, these types of people that he picks are these nomads, but he picks them and he walks, he literally comes in with his voice or his hand on a wall or some sort of prophecy and he has them understand that I've chose you, you have to go do this. People like Gideon, uh, where they want multiple signs and stuff and, and others who just do it. Well, on that note, who those who just do it are people like Joseph. The Lord didn't come to him. There, he had dreams, but no one told, there wasn't a messenger that said, hey, Joseph, these dreams mean these things. So he took those things, and with confidence, he told his brothers. He was, you know, chastised and then sold. Um, and then you have Rahab. Rahab, living in a city that was about to be overcome, no one came to her and said that you must do these things. She knew the power of the Lord, and it was upon that place, and she wanted to do the right thing. And then we have Ruth. Same thing. There was no divine workings there. Who Some messenger come to her and said, you must follow and, and do these things. And then the, my favorite man, David, uh, what, what are the things that are similar between these people? Well, that from their youth, they were following in his way. They were doing lawfulness. They were being graceful. And he was choosing these people and it, because they were malleable in a way that he could work with them, or they were hard-headed in a way that he could teach a lesson. Well, here's one example that I lately, I never read much about him, only the after part, but not the very first part. I didn't really pay very close attention, but Nehemiah. If we could turn over to Nehemiah 1. In Nehemiah, I've scanned up and down this, left and right. We'll read through the first part real quick so we can see, but the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Chis Chislev in the 12th year, 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of the brothers and some of the men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived ca captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who served the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before God of heaven. I said, I beseech you. Now, there's, there's two really important beseechments, and in, in from what I've read and, and 
one is here and the other was Abraham beseeching the Lord, uh, if there are so many in Sodom and Gomorrah, could we save it? But it is important that the Lord didn't come. This is what I'm trying to point out. He didn't say, hey, Nehemiah, there's wrong going on over here. In fact, Nehemiah said, Lord, there's wrong going over here. May I go do something about it? Reminding him of his love, reminding him of his word, reminding him, we remember who you are. Essentially, the core point that I'm pointing at is you don't need to wait for the bell to ring. You don't need to have your phone on loud waiting for God to call. You don't need to be staring at every single leaf and the way it flips and turns to know that if you see something in here that can be done out here, it's your, you go to God, say, hey, wonderful almighty father, this is, according to your word, wrong. Can I, can I help? Can I do this? Can I, can I make some change? Sometimes, and just like Nehemiah, he didn't wait for an answer. He was sad before the king, and the king asked him, what's wrong? And he said, well, how could I be happy if this is going on? Still no word from the Lord. He's seeing what you're going to do, Nehemiah. And what does Nehemiah do? He tells the king. The king grants him. So why would a king let his wine taster just walk off? Well, the guy was leading a righteous life, apparently. He was doing the right things. He was, he was the one who drank the wine before the king to see if it was poison he was going to die. That's, that was his job. He also taste tested things. And, and, but this man then decided that he was going to go gather up people and go rebuild the walls. Rebuild the walls of the city. If the Lord didn't want it to happen, he would have stopped it, right? But because Nehemiah knew the Lord, just like these other people, Joseph, Rahab, Ruth, David, at times we hear and see what he's trying to do. But sometimes it's your job to look at this word here with a righteous judgment and say that this thing that's going on is wrong. Lord, can I change it? Can I help? And if so, help me. Because we can't do this on our own. And that's all I have for you today.